Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's GoFly Master Lecture. To kick us off, I'm going to pass it over to Gwen Leiter, CEO and founder of GoFly. Gwen? Hello, everyone, and we are so pleased that you are joining us here today. Uh, we have the great pleasure of having Jeremy Conrad as our master. As you all know, GoFly's grand sponsor is Boeing, and we are joined and partnered with over 20 different aerospace and engineering and STEM organizations around the world. And together, we are pleased to bring you Jeremy Conrad today. Jeremy is the CEO of a new robotics company focused on the future of automation. And previously, he was the founding partner at Lemnos, which is an early stage hardware focused venture fund. Prior to Lemnos, Mr. Conrad was an active duty United States Air Force officer working on the Airborne Laser Program. And Jeremy has received his BS in mechanical engineering from MIT. And he has a wealth of information for all of us regarding venture capital and networking and fundraising. So we are so pleased to welcome Jeremy Conrad today to uh, let us learn from him. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Now let me just pull my slides up right here. There we go. Yeah, and so today I'm here to talk to you about kind of something that I think is one, it's something that I has always been a pet peeve of mine. A lot of people assume that like networking, when they hear it, it's kind of this like swarmy, like kind of businessy kind of term. But it's actually, it doesn't have to be that way. But also, it's actually a key skill that I think a lot of entrepreneurs overlook. And so, you know, but I just want to start by telling you a little bit about myself. So I was a 2006 undergrad. You know, I did mechanical engineering as an undergrad, but I actually spent most of my time in the aerospace department doing research. So. I worked on a satellite program, I worked on drones, I worked on a spacesuit while I was there. And for me, it was all about like getting my hands dirty. Even as an undergrad, like classes aren't what I focused on. It was really about like, what can I go build here? And that entire time I was doing Air Force ROTC. And when I graduated college, I kind of won the Air Force lottery and I got to work on the airborne laser. So this was a $5 billion program. It was the strongest laser in the world. It was a megawatt class continuous laser. Uh, on the lower left there, you see that's the actual optic. So, you know, we took a 747, we cut the nose off it, we did like the biggest retrofit anyone's ever done, and then we put the largest laser in the world on it. And so I was very fortunate while I was there in the lower right, we actually got to shoot down, which people have been working on for about 15 years. So in that lower right picture, on the far right, that's the plane. On the far left, that's the actual missile. And this is an infrared photo, and that's the actual laser itself blowing up that. And, you know, so I got a lot of understanding of just like how like, you know, big science and big engineering actually works. And then I quit. And I quit my job, and I got in a car, and I drove west, and I drove to, to San Francisco. And I always knew I wanted to start a company. And when I got to San Francisco with my co-founder, Helen, you know, we talked about a lot of different things. And really what inspired us was that no one was funding hardware. And, you know, we were mechanical engineers and the valley of software. And we said, well, everyone says it takes too much time and costs too much money. But the reality was things had changed. And so, you know, there's this old adage as an entrepreneur that sometimes when you have a problem, the company you need to start solves that problem because other people will have that problem as well. So it's a hardware focused seed stage venture capital fund. You know, that very first fund was just $2 million. It took forever to get there. You know, honestly, we pitched up and down the valley and everyone said no. The second fund, you know, we actually did well enough. We did 14 investments with that fund. And with that fir first fund, that managed to let us close a $20 million, what we call institutional round. So most venture capital firms are funded by what are called institutional limited partners. So these are pensions. These are like nonprofit endowments. These are sovereign wealth funds, things of that nature. With that, we did another 15 investment and that well enough that we raised a third fund that was over $50 million. And so the whole strategy with Lemnos has always been a few number of companies a year that we really put some work into. So we do six to 10 investments a year, writing checks between a quarter million dollars up to 1.5 million. And so as a result, we've done 42 investments to date. You know, we've actually done a fair number of aerospace company. We've got one satellite company called Spire, which does non-imaging satellites from orbit. Um, they've been very successful. We've looked at a lot of those space investments, and then we have a fairly extensive drone portfolio. Also, we have got a lot of robotics, consumer electronics, things like that. And 
collectively they've raised over $400 million and they've employed about 500 million people. But you know, as an entrepreneur at heart, things are, you know, things are always changing. So actually, uh, late last summer, I made the decision that I actually left Limnos. And so uh, January 1st was actually my last day. And so I'm still a venture partner helping advise them on sourcing um, and screening companies, but full time, I'm now the CEO of a robotics company. And so kind of a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about today, it's like, I've lived now multiple times, and it really is kind of a testament to how, you know, these soft skills can be critical differentiators for your success as a founder. So people ask, you know, why build a network? It's like, you might be excellent technically, you might really understand the business, but what, what is the value here? So there's three reasons, and each one of these I'm gonna go into detail on, and the reality is that each one of these can make or break your business. So let's jump in. So on recruitment, so I just started a company, my co-founder is someone I've known for a decade, and when it got announced that we were starting this company, we had four different ultra high quality people reach out to us and say, hey, I've always wanted to work with you. These are people who, you know, if you cold call them, they won't respond. If you offer them a job, they're happy. They can, they're, they're so good at what they do, they get to optimize for, you know, who do they want to work with. And so, you know, this is a, a kind of standard org chart for a company that's just past seed stage. I've got 17 full-time people. And when you really start to think about it and you say, well, how many people do I know? How many people could I convince to join me? How many people could I convince to convince their friends to join us? So just on day one, the value of your network in terms of who you can hire, if you can't think of, you know, maybe your first five or 10 employees, you know, that's problematic because for us, it's like, not only can we think of our first five or 10 employees, but it's because we've known them for five, 10, sometimes even 15 years. And that can really change whether or not you can find these people or not. The other thing is business partnerships. So Limnos has a long standing relationship with General Electric. And we actually ran an entrepreneurship competition inside of GE last year, where the winner actually got to leave GE and get funding from both Limnos and GE. And it all started with this email, a random cold email from like a consulting firm. And what they were doing is they were doing research for GE. So I took a meeting with these guys, you know, impressed them. They were like, That's the, they actually introduced us to the chief marketing officer of GE. And Beth Comstock came out to Limnos, had lunch with us. She liked us well enough that she introduced us to the head of GE Ventures. And GE Ventures is now invested in several Limnos portfolio companies and actually gives us a lot of insight, even when we're screening deals about what we should be focusing on and what really matters. And then there's money. So, you know, I said that we, we scraped the valley for those first $2 million. And so, you know, at the very beginning, we raised a quarter million bucks from friends and family and everyone else said no. And so this email, so Derek was someone who was just getting started at the time. He runs a lecture series. I had gone and spoken at it. And so he knew this guy that we'd been trying to get in front of named Naval. Naval runs a site called AngelList. Naval's been around forever. And he finally gets us the intro to Naval that's stuck. And so Naval walks in and it's like it's out of a movie. Naval walks in, we start to pitch him and 15 minutes in he says, I get it, I love it, I'm in, my buddies are in, but I double booked this so I gotta run. And he just walks out. And we sit there and we look at each other and we say, you know, is he kidding? Is this a joke? And six weeks later, we had a million and a half dollars. Naval invested, Naval emailed a number of his friends and said, I'm investing. I think this is the next big thing. I think you should do this as well. And, and that social cred actually matters so much that at the very end of it, and I looked at the people, list of people who'd invested. And I, there was two names I didn't recognize and I asked my partner, I said, I don't remember meeting these people. And she said, well, we did it. She said both of them had co-founders who invested but didn't want to do the full slug themselves. So on a 30 minute phone call, those guys agreed to write us checks too. And that really kind of blew my mind of like kind of the closeness of these networks and why it's so important of these trust-based systems built over one, five, 10 years have everything to do with how fast your company can move. And anything worth doing, other people are gonna be working on. So the speed really starts to matter here. So, you know, that's like vague and cool and awesome, but how do you actually really get started? Well, for me, it was all about starting in person. Rule number one is don't be an asshole. There's so many people in this valley who I won't do business with because they were a dick to me. When I was getting started, like, you know, I don't even care if you didn't meet with me, but if you were like, actively antagonistic, there's also a lot of people who've screwed portfolio companies. So if you have been dishonest to someone, people hear about it and your reputation is everything. Any community you're in, be it aerospace, B2B, 
be it venture capital, you know, be it social media, everyone tends to know everyone and the power players definitely know each other. And so as a result, if you start to burn your reputation to get some easy wins early on, it can really start to affect you and kind of the people you do business with, with later. And so when I say certain person, it really is about like, how do you find the right places to meet the people? Now, when I got to the Valley, I was nobody, didn't know anyone. And so there's a lot of public events and this is true in any given sector. And so there, there might be meetups where you are, there might be conferences. And so you go and you know, you got to hustle a little bit, but you just start talking to people. And for me, it's like, I, I do not like people who are in stealth mode. I think you should be telling everyone in the world what you're working on. Because ideas aren't particularly novel, but what is novel is that they might, that person you're talking to might have the one connection you're looking for. They might know someone who worked on something similar before. And so, you know, as I said, if you go, even if you just go to meetup.com or there's these open happy hours, if you went to a school that has alumni events, those can be key places to meet people. And then there's public conferences. And so, you know, there's big public conferences that are harder to get to, but less, such as the ones I list here. So things like all things D, TED and Davos, there's this cycle that people go through and you, know, you start you know, being nobody like I was and over time you get to know people and if enough people start to like you, you start to, they start to reveal these kind of other layers of these ecosystems. So for these public conferences, you, know, you can start to get invited to them. If you get invited to speak at them, you don't have to pay for them. You know, as a you know, early startup founder, it's like, I don't have $5,000 to go speak at conferences like this, but if I can finagle a speaking slot because I have a viewpoint about something that they care about, well then suddenly they'll just like wave that for me. And that last thing, those private events, those dinners, you know, every night in the Valley, there's probably a dozen private dinners. They might be hosted by a venture capital firm. They might be hosted by Boeing. They might be hosted by Microsoft. And this is where like the people kind of get together and you can really get to know other people who are potential recruits, potential funding sources, and potential business partners. And these types of things, there's not even published, they never even published them, but they're just constantly happening. The other thing is like, how do you work a room? So when I got started, I'd go to these public events. A lot of times there'd be a list of who's going to be there. Like if you go to eventbrite or meetup.com. And so I would literally, me and my partner would go through the entire list of people coming to that event. And we'd say, look them up on LinkedIn. Are these people who might be interesting for us? Are these people who could be you know, useful for us for any reason? And I would have a cheat sheet of names and faces if we could find them. And I would stand in the room, I'd look down at my phone, I'd flip through my phone and look around. And so if I saw someone, I'd go find them, I'd go talk to them. When you're at a networking event like that, look at people's name tags. You know, there's five minutes max is all you're looking for. Why? Because you don't need to close them there. In sales, it's don't sell past the sale. And the reality is in five minutes, I know who they are, I know if we can be useful, and all I'm trying to do is get them to agree to a call or a coffee. Especially if you're trying to talk to someone like a speaker, who, you know, when I speak at events, I might get mobbed by like three, five, 10 people, and if I talk to you for a couple of minutes, I can say, oh, I wanna follow up with this person, give me your card. And the other thing is that it's, how do you get out of value, like valueless conversations? For the ones that aren't going well, just say, I need to go to the bathroom, fake a phone call, say, excuse me one second. Because if you're trying to you know, go to good events and there's 50 people in a room, you know, five minutes max, one minute minimum, like you're gonna maybe get through half the room in that event. And so the reality is you've gotta find a way to eject out of those bad conversations. And when you start, just start with three questions. You know, what's your name? Where do you work? And what do you do? And if you're prepared, you should know if that person meets criteria for something that you're all, at all interested in. And the reality is a lot of people aren't, and that's fine. And, you're going to these events not necessarily to make friends, but it's about like finding people who you can work together with. And then a little thing that's a personal thing for me is I never say nice to meet you. I go to a lot of events. I can meet one, two thousand people a year. Sometimes context switching is hard. Sometimes you just forget. And if you say nice to meet you, you betray that you don't recognize that. If they recognize you, they'll let you know. And you have about 30 seconds before before to figure out who they are before it gets awkward. But that gives, that gives you just a little bit more time. But a lot of times these people aren't at events. They are, you know, either cloistered up or the events they're at, like you just can't like grab them. So, so how do you get in front of these people? Top of the peak is trusted intro. So LinkedIn, Facebook, angel lists for some people. And part of this is on you to make sure that your networks are up to date. 
you know, part of that is don't accept LinkedIn connections from people you don't actually know. Why? Because when you search for someone and it says, oh, you have a second connection to them, if you don't actually know that connection, you can't leverage it. So it's really about building these tight circles. Facebook is also really useful for that. The next one is these cold calls. So alumni addresses, first dot, dot last at that company. You know, cold calls are always gonna have kind of a low response rate, but you'd be surprised. And then, you know, we went as far as we would set Google alerts for people for, to see if they're gonna speak at events. And then in Google, it just emails. And also, never show up the office uninvited. Occasionally, it happens to us at Lemnos, and it's like, it's really annoying. We're all busy people. It's just, a, it doesn't display hustle. It displays like disrespect in our opinion. And then you're a founder. Your time is important. So how do you, so you know, you've gone to that event, you've gotten that coffee with them. So what do you do from there? Well, because your time is valuable, there's a hierarchy about where you actually meet. You always want them to come to, to you. People undervalue how much travel time can eat out of their life. If they won't do that, try to find a neutral location, a coffee shop or, or a bar. Only go to ones where you've been to before by yourself. Because a lot of times you can pick a coffee shop or a bar for drinks that's too loud. The goal of this is to, you know, this is that 30, to, 30 minute to an hour meeting where you've got to impress them. They've got to walk away and say, I want to do business or I want to work for them. So you really need to be able to make an impression. So go ahead and scout things ahead of time. And last, their place. You know, obviously, if, if you're pitching someone much more important than you, you're going to have to go to them. When we first got started, we spent a lot of times going down to Palo Alto to pitch venture capitalists on Sand Hill Road. But it's also be, be very actionable. Take notes, take action items. In every meeting I'm in, I always actually specifically ask for something. Because I'm actually testing them to see if they follow up with me. Because it shows how they're going to interact in other meetings. Learn how to read body language. There's a bunch of books and videos you can watch just to understand that better. And then also, if you're doing a pitch, you know, have an agenda and script, but be very flexible. You know, when I first got started, my partner had worked in pro baseball and I'd worked in the Air Force. And almost anyone we pitched, we'd say our backgrounds and it would, one of our backgrounds would resonate with them. Either they were an aerospace person and they wanted to hear about lasers blowing things up or they wanted to hear about baseball. And the reality was even in that pitch, it still is about these people, if they're gonna invest in you, wanna work with you long-term. So they wanna to get to know you. So it's less important to get through every slide on the deck than it is about just having a good meeting. And then there's also the individual intelligence. Like how do you know if you know someone? And it really is about like finding commonality. It's a core human trait. We all want to like work and interact with people. We think, you know, understand us as humans. And so all these things are very low probability, but just stop them. Go on LinkedIn. If they've given interviews, watch the interviews, find out where they went to school, find anything you can. And it's, you know, in general, for most people, you can find something that there's commonality. And, and that's really important because then they can remember you like, oh, that guy, who he did the, he did the laser stuff or, or she worked in baseball or kind of all these little things because for all good people that you're trying to get any of these things from, the reality is they have a litany of choices. You know, you're never the only game in town. There's always another offer on the table. There's always another deal. And so you need to be memorable. So, you know, but th this is all very kind of abstract, but like, how do you actually, you know, like what are the other kind of criteria you use to understand if it's working? Well, you can start to get some concrete examples. One, um, you know, in the venture capital world, things get crazy quick. So a lot of these venture capital firms or these big corporate firms, they do these retreats. So this is an email inviting me to a private island with a bunch of people. And specifically, you know, when you go to these things, it's awesome. It's like 20, 30, maybe 40 people. You get to spend two, three days with them. And these are often people that as an early stage founder, you would never give you the time of day, but suddenly by being there, you have this credibility. And so these types of relationships get built over, over two, three years. Here's another one. So this is these dinners that I'm talking about. So I got this about a year ago, and this was actually a you know, Fortune 30 company. And you know, at this meeting, I met like Rodney Brooks, who is the founder of one of the biggest robotics companies in the world. I met one of the heads of one of the largest PR firms in the world who we might work with. And so there's all these little things. And, you know, suddenly you're at dinner next to them and you can get that casual conversation. And so because it's very low risk for them to attend these because the people who curate these are very high quality, that's kind of really what they're looking for. Every one of these people is looking to find the highest value for their time. And so when you can sneak in, and as an early stage founder, what you have going for you is, you know, in some sense, you represent the future. 
you represent that you have an idea or a different perspective or you're disruptive. And a lot of these bigger companies or bigger firms, they're always looking to talk to those people. So if you're well-spoken, if you're interesting, if you've got, you know, any technology that they, you know, kind of can blow their mind, which a lot of these people don't come from these backgrounds, it can easily kind of get up there. And then there's after hours. So uh, this is a picture from one of my buddies weddings. And so this is my glorified drinking buddies from college, but we all kept in really good touch. And so, you know, the guy on the right there started a self-driving car company. The guy next to him started a drone defense company. The guy behind him sticks, you know, started a hedge fund and on and on and on to this list. And the reality is I just did a good job keeping in touch with my friends from college. And a lot of times, you know, it is about those small things about, you know, going and grabbing a drink with someone, going to a birthday party. And the thing is, is like, and this is, you know, the way I view the world is like, I don't think you have to split the world into your friends and your business associates. You know, for me, it's like, I love what I do. A lot of these people also like kind of exude kind of their life experiences as well. And so as a result, like we get along really well. And so as I'm starting this company, the number of people who I'm like, I need to talk to that person, you know, one of the people on the screen, like right here is how I can get those intros. So practical tips, you know, for me, it's like, I think that there's, you should always blend your kind of theory and otherwise. So fundraising, you know, money is like oxygen for startups. And if you're not careful, you can easily end up in a position where you run out. So there is a seasonality of fundraising, you know, starting to raise in January and September are the best times. And it's just because VCs are people. So, you know, many VCs have families, they go on vacation in August, they come back in September when the kids are back in school ready to work. Same thing applies for December. And so, you know, at the Series A level, so, uh, you know, in venture capital, there's seed firms that are investing in half a million to $3 million, say, Series A firms typically do three to $10 million. They're partnerships. So they're typically four to eight people and they need to have a vote. And so if there aren't as many of the partners around, they have to like wrangle them. There's all this extra logistics. So January and September are the best time to start. And if you start raising in January and you know, if things are going well, you'll close sometime in March or early April. If you start in September, it'll close late November, or early December. If you email someone December 1st and say, hey, I'm raising, the first thing they'll say is come back later. Or worse, they'll take one meeting and then they'll kind of remember you, but then they'll go on vacation and atrophies. And so there's a kind of a theory that some people call the dot line curve theory of fundraising, which is that ideally a year before you're gonna raise, you go grab coffee with them and you say, here's where we're at. And you try to underplay where you're at. And then six months later, you're like, here's all the progress you've made. And then you know, six months after that is when you're actually starting to raise. <clears throat> and so they've been able to see progress. Because the problem is if, if you are brilliant and walk into a venture firm and say, here's what we have. And the thing they don't know is really how long it took you and how much effort it took to get there. Whereas if you show them steady progress over time, the, the partner who you're pitching, because remember, you always need an advocate at that table. They can pound the table and say, look, I've been watching this, this team for a year. They're awesome. They have, they, a year ago, this is where they're at. Here's what they're at today. If we give them this money, I think two years from now, they're just gonna be killing it. And so part of that is also about like rounds happen when you know, people think they're gonna miss out. And so being able to kind of structure your raise. And so you've got to do the work one, two years ahead of time. Because, you know, so for me, it's like, I don't plan to raise a Series A for some time. I've already had a bunch of Series A meetings. Why? Because I want to like kind of give them the perspective about where I'm at. Also, I'm trying to find good fits. So I've had 19 Series A meetings already. And, you know, our company is just getting off the ground. And that bottom point, the pro tip, it's like if you're actually in pitch mode, you're going to be taking a lot of these meetings at some point, your co-founder is going to freak out and it's going to be because they have not eaten or because they have not slept or because they are dehydrated and just little things like that can actually, you know, people start to tweak out in meetings. If you, you know, you often get in a situation where you might have eight, 10 meetings in a week and it's the same pitch and it's the same questions and it's like kind of this torture exercise, but getting through it is going to be like how you raise that money you need to make the company successful. And you know, kind of in this environment, you know, yes, venture capital is dilutive money, but it, you know, as someone who I used to issue a lot of SBRs, I used to issue a lot of government grants, you know, government money is the worst clean, like the worst, you know, non-dilutive money in the world. The reality is that there's so much overhead with taking government money. On top of that, there's also things like what's happening right now. Congress keeps bashing CRs, which means that if you were supposed to get money in October, you probably still haven't gotten. 
And so you can end up in these really dangerous situations, whereas, you know, venture capital, they put the money in, and at the end of the day, they have relatively little control. Like, yes, they take a board seat, and like, yes, they can fire a founder, but that's really kind of the limits of what they can do. And if you don't document it, it didn't happen. So pick a good CRM. CRM is a tool that people use just to document their networks. And uh, you know, I use Contactually. It links into my Gmail. Every interaction matters. I have like alerts on who I haven't talked to in a period of time. Because as I said, it's about like how do they how do you keep yourself top of mind? How do you keep yourself kind of in their kind of mental loop? Because the second you fall out of it, you know, you're in a really rough place. Because it's really like once they've dismissed you, it's once they've said no, it's really hard to kind of get back into that mind share. And then also, it's about competitive intelligence. You know, the reality is, especially if in a sector like aerospace, there's, you know, there's this many VCs in the world, and like this many VCs who know anything about aerospace. So they get to see a lot of the pitches. So if you don't kind of at least understand how you fit in the ecosystem, you're going to be at a disadvantage. So one, when you pitch, it's like they will often ask questions that maybe they won't say, but so-and-so is doing X, but if you know that your competitor is pursuing a very specific technology stack and you're pitching someone and they say, well, what about this tech stack? One, you know, probably means they've been pitched by the other people in the past, but they're looking for a good explanation because they probably like said something about your tech stack that was derogatory. Also, it's about setting expectations. You know, at the end of the day as a founder, like you are the soul of the company and people look to you. So if you look like, you know, you didn't know what was going on, then that really starts to affect people. And the other thing is that it's about differentiation. So kind of famously Dropbox versus Box early on, Dropbox went after the consumer market and Box went after the corporate market. And sure, over time, now they've kind of converged, but it really gave them a kind of like separate areas to try to dominate. Whereas if they both picked the same area early on and just competed each other to death, it's possible they both would have, would have failed. And it's about knowing your customers. So uh, Compology is a portfolio company for Lindos, and they do a connected trash stuff. So they put sensors and dumpsters that let you know when to come pick it up. They can save the number of pickups you need pretty substantially. In the waste management business, it's all about operational efficiency. So this is, you know, kind of industrial IoT. So, you know, they're started in San Francisco. You know, they went out there with these t-shirts. They went to their first waste management conferences. And people in waste management are exactly who you think. And so like a, like a light green shirt and like San Francisco, this really wasn't their vibe. And so, you know, they got to know them a little bit better. And then the next time they had these kind of shirts. And they said that in the, those first shirts they had, they, they basically couldn't give them away. These shirts, they ran, not only did they run out of, but people kept asking them for. And, you know, as always, it, it is about that competitive intelligence. Different markets have different things. How you recruit versus your customer base might be very different people. So you need to position yourself and understand each of these things. And if you don't, then you're going to lose out on one of them. And then there's outbound marketing. So all of this stuff has been more kind of like the, you know, you as a founder, what can you do day to day? What can you do like really kind of, you know, kind of like nights, weekends, all sorts of stuff. But this is nothing to do, I haven't spoken at all about like, how do you actually get the word out? So I'll spend a little time on that. First thing you have to ask is, do you want to build a personal brand? So for me, I'm the fa I, you know, I was the face of Lemno, so if we got a request to speak at a conference, I was gonna go speak at a conference. You know, I've got to be on TV a couple times, I've got to be quoted in a bunch of different publications that you read, and the reality is, is like, you know, for me it's like, I wanna build a brand, not a huge brand. I have other friends who like wanna be like famous, but it, like, I'm okay being in front of the camera. My other partners are not as much, and that's fine, but on your team, you have to understand who is and who isn't going to do it. And if no one wants to, then I'd recommend finding it, you know, especially as aerospace kind of has this reemergence and heyday today, there's a lot more public you know, interest in it. And so as a result, if you're willing to talk about it and speak well, you find yourself on panels and presentations, and that's the one-to-many interactions. And at the end of the day, if you don't find a way to do one to many, then you're like, at some point you have difficulty scaling. So keep the deck simple. Um, you know, like, and I, I mean, simple in two ways. One, it's like lots of pictures, like keep the deck, like, you know, stylistically simple, but also the topics can be simple. You know, if you have a really kind of meaty thing, go ahead and write that up and publish it. Why? Because it's like different people absorb different information at different rates. And so, you know, for this kind of talk, it's like something that like, I think a lot of people can understand. It's a great kind of thing to put into 45 minutes. Um, there's a lot of little stylistics here. It's like, turn off all messaging clients. Why? Because if you get text messages during your talk, they show up on the screen. I've been in pitches before where their boyfriend or girlfriend is suddenly like, 
oh, hey, like, congrats, you know, good luck. And it's like everyone laughs, but it's still like it interrupts your flow. And also, if you want to play a video, go to the room beforehand, plug in everything beforehand and make sure it will play. There's so many speeches I seem to rail about like, being like, oh, it doesn't work. Let me try this. Let me try that. I almost never use videos in my speaking just because I often won't have the opportunity to really get out there. And if you can engage the audience, um, uh, for a lot of a lot of times I give this particular talk, I do it in person, and I have a couple different activities I do, but um, they just don't work uh, digitally as well. And then there's one to me. Uh, you know, like I talk about how like even at MIT, like an all undergrads required to take like a humanities intensive subject. Why? It's because if you can't communicate, did it ever really happen? And if you can only communicate in like kind of journals or very specific kind of groups of people, it's like as a founder, that's not good enough. You know, in some sense, as a founder, your job is to make sure everyone knows what you're doing. And, there, and if it's not your natural bailiwick, that's fine. You know, it's all about practice. So one is to videotape yourself. Watching yourself is the most uncomfortable experience for most people, but it's so important. Anytime I give a talk, if there's a tape, I watch it. It's awkward, but I always learn something about myself. The other is if you can team up with other founders is something called PowerPoint roulette. So you put 20 slides, 10 second time on each slide, the random slides, whoever's speaking has never seen them before. And you just start talking and you try to make a coherent pitch like presentation around these 20 slides and every time it advances, you've got to connect it back in. It's hilarious, it's a fun thing to do over a couple of beers, but what it's actually doing is it's building your skills to like improvise. It's building your skills that if you get a question or you kind of continue talking so you don't have to stick to a script. I've been in pitches where people literally have scripts and it, it just never works. People are always going to be engaging with you. And if you can't write, you can find someone who can. I'm not the best writer. I've definitely like had people help me out when I write blog posts to edit them, make sure they sound good. And it's an oldie but a goodie, but the book How to Win Friends and Influence People is like still great. Almost 100 years later, highly recommend it. And then everyone says at some point they get a little bit of money, they're like, we should do some PR. And you always have to ask yourself, well, why? You know, is it, is it vanity? Do you just want to see your name and your company names like in print? Do you, you know, which admittedly is cool, but maybe not the best business expense. Um, or is there like a purpose for it? Now, I will say it's important to understand there's between PR and marketing. So marketing is when you go buy ads. And so this is like, you have a sales campaign. Oftentimes marketing is around like, you know, you're selling a specific product. Whereas PR is more about kind of like the story of your company or like kind of getting your name out there. So, you know, we've, Lemnos has engaged PR firms at various times. And so, you know, I will get a phone call from the PR agency. They say, you know, one time it was like, Bloomberg needs someone tomorrow to talk about drones. Okay, cool. I will be there whenever they want. It might be, you know, the Wall Street Journal is looking for a quote about robotics. Can you do that? And so those things are, you know, like in, in each individual case, it's like, well, is this what moves the needle? But the goal is that when people like look you up, they understand that like, you know, people trust you and understand. you. Now, early on, you have the problem that no one knows who you are. You know, even, even the most well-connected founders quickly exhaust their total network. And so how do you actually get the word out there? Well, it's through this PR kind of thing. Also, if you announce your funding, it can give you some street cred. And that's really important because a lot of people have been burned by startups that were pre-funding or didn't have much funding. And as a result, they like joined and then it failed within six to 12 months. And then uh, the customer traction. So this helps the product launches, it saves you money. So if you are unveiling the new best awesome thing in the world, publications will write about that. And, it, you know, and instead of having to buy every little out of the world, this gives you one slug. Famously, Apple gets billions of dollars of unpaid marketing every year because everyone covers all of their launches like slavishly. And there's also this aspect about, you know, depending on what field you work in, this is true in robots, this is true in aerospace, that a lot of times, like due to kind of the evolution of the technology from a military sphere, you have to worry about like kind of like the, what the public perception is. So, you know, when we started investing in drones in 2011, drones did one thing, drones killed people. And so whenever drone, you know, drone strikes, whenever it was referenced, you know, predators, you name it. And so, but the, as the commercial drone industry, industry grew, this was kind of a problem. This was a problem from a recruiting perspective because some people didn't want to go work on like killer drones. This was a problem from a venture perspective because venture doesn't typically fund military technology. And so we, uh, Linus is an investor in a company called Airware, and they really went on a major PR campaign. 
In addition, like, you know, people like Bezos. Bezos is like, I want to change the narrative here. You know, this was brilliant. Not only did it kind of like unveil some of their ambitions, but in terms of unearned media, this was the day before Cyber Monday. So everyone saw this great ad for Amazon and went and bought everything. But so when Airbnb really started to think about it, well, their PR firm came up with this thing. And at the time they were called Unmanned Innovation. And what they really wanted to do is they wanted to say, well, how do we kind of change the narrative about what drones can do? So they actually ran an Indiegogo around saving endangered species in Africa. And they said, you know, we're raising money to put these radio tags on there so these drones can track them. And it's like the most feel good story ever. And so it got picked up. So, you know, suddenly they're in the bird. And so then when you like go ahead and Google Airware, you find this article. And they're like, oh, okay, well, drones are doing more than I thought that they could do. Then it's like, you know, this is Jonathan Downey, who's a CEO, was a CEO over there. And then he's like, you know, walk, writing about in publications to help influence policy. So, you know, kind of as you go through your startup, there is like more and more kind of games get unlocked. And the really advanced game is how like nationwide policy can affect your startup. And so Jonathan, you know, became, you know, like a person, like he, he became a person people talked to about drones. He became, Airware became a company people thought of when they were thinking about what can drones do. And it ended with him getting, you know, nominated uh, to the, you know, tech review, which is a prestigious publication and called him a visionary. And, you know, and all this may seem like kind of tried and ego driven, but the reality is that when employees, when funding, when partners, when all these people start to make decisions, everyone has Google. And so they're always looking for validation that they're going to be working with someone great. Even more so at a venture capital firm or a business, the way it works is that, you know, you have your advocate, but all of their partners might be looking for a reason to say no. So there's a whole bunch of people who've never met you who have the ability to spike this deal. And so as a result, like the, having this footprint on the internet or just kind of out there, that mind share can really start to help you over time. But you have to pick what kind of press do you want and why do you want it? You know, a lot of times PR firms can get you into some publication, but it may not be relevant to you. So if you're trying to recruit like software developers from Silicon Valley, or maybe like a series ABC, Tech blogs are great. TechCrunch, all things D, Recode, kind of the, the standard batch. If you're looking to get partnerships with Fortune 500 companies, then you probably want to focus on kind of more mainstream business publications. If you're trying to like recruit in a specific industry, then like understand which ones you actually want to under, like things like IEEE Spectrum or AIAA. And then lastly, if you're like trying to be a much broader kind of brand, then that and only then is when you should really be looking at things like TV or these really broad based publications. You know, the, the, for us, it's like we care about building the, the mind share for Lemnos and for my new company, we're still like kind of formulating that strategy. It's just the two of us now. So it doesn't make any sense for us to really be pursuing this. Now, everyone's, I've met a lot of entrepreneurs who are afraid of talking to reporters and certainly know a lot of entrepreneurs who've had bad experiences talking to reporters. But in my experience, they're a pretty reasonable bunch. The problem is, is that they're reporters. They're going to write about what you talk to them about. And so if you run your mouth on topics or say something like crazy, like that is what's newsworthy. So one, I, whenever I talk to reporters, I literally pre-write everything I want to talk to them about. And if I'm on the phone with them, I have it up on my screen in front of me. And whatever question you ask, they ask you, you, you try to bring it back to those talking points. Always have stock photos available, whether it's print or web, people always like photos and they don't have time to send a photographer over it. So have, you know, go ahead and take photos of yourself, take photos of your product, because then you can say, oh, I've got some you know, pictures and that might take up more physical space than the article batch, and it draws people in. Little things, if you're gonna be on film or doing photo shoots, always wear solid colors. Um, cameras do funky things with patterns. Now, at some point in a company's life, something's going to go wrong. And so there, there is a little bit of crisis PR or just like any PR. If you get asked a question you don't want to answer, just don't answer. In a standard interview, if they're really trying to dig on something, they'll ask the same question typically three times in three different ways because they're trying to get you to answer the thing. And what they're preying on is the, you know, in polite society, if someone asks you a direct question, you like feel obligated to answer it, but you shouldn't hear. And so, you know, some quotes you can use, it's like, that's a great question, but the heart of the matter really is, insert the question that I really want to answer. The other is that, sorry, company policy won't, won't let me disclose that. 
it's okay if you as the founder just made that policy up. You know, you're under no obligation to really like engage with them about these topics. Now, if you set up an interview to talk about something specific and don't want to talk about that, just don't do that. But in general, it's like when you are talking to a reporter, it's about a specific thing. There's this great book out there. It's called Toxic Sludge is Good for You. It's about the kind of PR industry and crisis PR. And I think it really helps shape kind of like what the, you know, how to deal with people. And then what else is there? So there's blogging, there's Twitter, there's talks. There's a lot of different ways to engage with it. It's about finding your voice. Like where do you resonate with like, you know, kind of the larger community? And so you do all this work, you make all these friends, you know these people, how do you keep up with them? It's like, you know, our CRM that for Limnos is like five or 6,000 entries in it. So how do you say who's important and how do you keep there? Well, there's a couple of different ways. One is I use Twitter. So, you know, as an early stage founder and as a VC, it's like, I actually find Twitter a great way to engage with other VCs. And so Manu runs a seed stage fund here. Bilal is at Lux Capital, uh, which it does a lot of high tech stuff. And I know both of them, but I don't get to see them that often. And so as a result, if they're having a conversation that I have something relevant to say, I just inject myself. And so here I'm making a joke. It's like an inside baseball kind of joke about the size of different rounds. And so they respond. And so this reminds them that I exist. This reminds them that like, I understand what is going on. And so for me, it's like, I'm, I have a very limited Twitter presence. It's really about making sure that I'm engaging with a handful of people on the right topics. And as I said, a lot of times it's simply about, these are just people that you can't spend that much time with. But then there's also things like this. So Josh is a buddy of mine. Josh uh, is a serial entrepreneur. He's incredibly successful. And just him posting on Facebook, he has a startup idea. Um, I don't know if I can pull up a pointer, but you know, Alex Tasso on the right there, he's a partner at Lightspeed, which is a billion dollar fund. David Hornick is a partner at August, which is another $500 million fund. Peter Pham is another person. And the reality is over time, Josh has maintained this great network. Part of it is Josh runs something called the, the Robot Racing League. So Josh rents out a racetrack every year and invites all of these people out and they all come. And, and the thing is these soft kind of social interactions kind of help build credit over time. Because as I said, all these things come back down to trust, comes back down to getting to know people. And every little thing you do can matter. And sure, if you hate social media, that's fine. There's a lot of different ways to do it. And so for me, I, part of this sharing, this is just kind of sharing my story. And so knowing these various people has, you know, in just the four weeks we've been active with this company, been incredibly helpful. And then it's, you know, for me, it's, it's about doing the full, full press. So for me, I try to have two breakfasts a week, one lunch and two happy hours, because at the end of the day, there's a lot of people I need to catch up with. And if I can do three to five of those a week, you know, and it doesn't take an hour of like kind of standard work time. It gives me a lot more time to do other things. And then as I said, parties, deep dives, industry event, understand what the service area of your, event, of your ecosystem is and really kind of like inject yourself into it. So for instance, you know, last uh, spring, I did the first ever Lemnos Boston Hardware Dinner. These are a collection of founders and entrepreneurs. Right here, we have like one of the founders of SolidWorks. We have the founders of Formlabs. We have a couple of VCs. We have a couple of founders of robotics companies. And you know, people love coming to events like this. And so for me, you know, now that I've left Lemnos, even as a venture partner, I plan to still do these types of things because then I get to pick who I'm interacting with. Then I get to pick who, you know, like gets to know me better. And over time, these things can really build up to be something pretty transformational. And that's all I got. So uh, I hope you guys have been submitting questions. If you have any questions for me, I'm just Jeremy at Luminous Labs. And then uh, my Twitter handle is at Nomadic Nerd. Um, and yeah, that, that's all I have. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, so a couple questions. Um, so one, uh, you talked a little bit about how uh, Lemnos works a lot with hardware things and GoFly is going to be very uh, hardware heavy. Do you have any uh, particular advice for people uh, specifically thinking about their new aerospace hardware that they might be designing? So in the past year, I've seen more aerospace startups founded, pitched, and funded than I have probably in the prior five years. So it's a great time to be in it. But one thing that I think is really important is understanding what your first milestone is. So in the venture ecosystem, like seed stage rounds are typically two or three million bucks. So find something you can pitch that you can do with that. And you know, yes, sometimes crazy rounds happen and there are like 50 or $100 million first rounds. But as a founder, it's like if you baseline on that, you're, you're in a pretty tough position. So especially if you're a newer founder, it's like find something you can do. 
I mean, with Spire, one thing that's really interesting is they built and launched their first two satellites for eight hundred thousand dollars. And so that proved that they could do it. They got some data. If you're more on the aero side of thing, like small scale form factors, sure, that works. Or bench top prototypes, those types of things can then trigger later rounds. But the more tech risk there is, there needs to be less like market risk. So you need to have something where you say, hey, you know, if you go to Series A or Series B, I need ten million dollars to reduce tech risk on this. I have high confidence we can do it. But at the end of the day, like if we do this, there's a lot of people who are going to buy it. Great, awesome. Uh, so as uh, phase one participants are putting together their uh, designs to submit to the GoFly competition, uh, what sorts of things should they be thinking about as they uh, repurpose some of that information for like a pitch deck? So pitch decks, it's all about you know, being concise. And you know, like certainly you have to like, you know, from, a, from a pitch perspective, part of it is really telling your story. And that's why, like, you know, when I look through a deck, you know, I, you know, probably do 10 decks a week. What I'm looking for is the key bits of information. Tell me that you understand that there's a market there, or at least that, like, your pitch is that there could be a market there. Tell me that, like, the technology is not impossible. And tell me that, like, you, the team is, like, you know, someone who I think has credibility to actually go ahead and accomplish that. Great. Uh, and the GoFly community is... Uh, worldwide they're all across the globe uh you have the benefit of being in san francisco in the valley uh in close physical proximity to uh you know really great ecosystem what advice do you have for people that uh, might not be in uh, san francisco and might not be in the united states get on a plane honestly it's like you know i spent five years in albuquerque and the the venture scene there is like there's like a handful of firms, a handful of angels, and those same entrepreneurs pitching those people, if they just flew to San Francisco, spent two weeks pitching out here, they get more money, better terms, and better networks overnight. Awesome. Uh, and do you have any particular specific advice for competitors in a GoFly competition? Um, I mean, really, it's like it, aerospace is an exciting place to be right now, but it's like as you start to build your teams, really understand like that you're recruiting people that understand the difference between, you know, an early stage startup and working at like a fortune 500 company. You know, one thing that we found in recruiting out of these larger organizations is sometimes people are used to having like very, very narrow, strictly defined things that they want to do for years. Whereas your first 20 employees, they got to be pretty flexible because things are going to change. There might be a shortfall. You need people who really have the mentality and understand kind of what you're doing and like all hands on deck to accomplish that. Great. Thanks. Um, sounds good. So uh, as competitors are thinking about these really early stage designs that they might be uh, submitting, uh, how do you balance the uh, you know, proprietary nature of those designs and not wanting to share them until they're like totally protected with trying to get people excited about what you're up to? So I think that at the end of the day, like, you know, you don't have to share that much. Um, certainly, like when you're in final stages of closing, like an employee, you can sign up to an NDA. But the reality is that for most people, you're pitching, be it for money, for partnerships, for you know, for recruitment. You you shouldn't need to tell that much. You're like, we are building like this that does Y, X that does Y, and either they're interested or not. And if they're to the point where they're like, well, I only want to take a first meeting if I do heavy diligence, they're probably not going to be a great partner for you because. You're a startup. You don't have all the answers. If they want to diligence everything, it's like definitionally early stage companies. It's like even if your design is solid, your like business model might be, might not be. And so you know, no one's gonna have it all together. So you need to find those people who are willing to kind of take a little bit of risk. You know, for us, we only really dig hardcore into details like that. Like once we're pretty far along in our process. Great, thanks. Uh, and then just a little bit of uh, a question around uh, people's personal backgrounds and work histories. So, uh, you know, you might not have had like a huge experience in venture capital before you uh, started uh, Lemnos. C can you give some advice to people or say a little bit about uh, how important your background is in a particular area, if you might be doing something new? <laughs> um, in, in general, I would never advise someone to just quit their job and start a venture capital firm. Um, it, was a, it was a long road, it worked out really well for us, um, but you know, in terms of repeatability, especially now, um, there's a lot more firms out there. Um, but I think that if you're looking to kind of break up, break into like early startup plan or, or venture land, it's like, you know, find, find someone to work for. Like if you, if you work for a company that's 10, 20 people for a year, 18 months, you'll learn so much more. And then going to go be a VC or a founder is going to be that much easier. 
Great. And then what about uh, specifically with like the, the aerospace industry? Any, any advice there? I, I like moved to San Francisco. People are like hiring like crazy for aerospace people. I mean, you have tons of drone companies, you have tons of rocket companies, you have tons of satellite companies, and, and you don't even have to move to the Bay Area. One thing to, to kind of modify what I said earlier is more and more Bay Area venture capital firms are investing outside the Bay Area. And like, you know, they're going to Seattle, they're going to Denver, they're going to LA, they're investing kind of in a broader swath of um, industries and areas. So you don't necessarily have to be here, but like there are certainly advantages to it. Um, but I think at the end of the day, like the, the number of aerospace startups that are very viable and doing really interesting stuff, it's like they're here, they're happening. You know, you can go on, there's a site called Crunchbase, which is free. And you can just like look up aerospace and you can see all the companies that have been funded and go talk to those founders. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, and do you have any advice for, for people that might be pitching technology that is considered really far out in front of uh, what's currently on the market right now, something that's like decades out there? Uh, you know, how is that different from pitching something that's sort of like an incremental step? How do you get people on board? So, I mean, <laughs> far out in decades is particularly far out. Um, I mean, so in general, like the venture capital industry is, is – you know, the, the job of a venture capitalist is to invest in a company that they think can be successful, ideally generating hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue within a decade. Like that's notionally the game here. So if you have something that's gonna take 20, 30 years, it's, it's pretty hard to find funding for that. Honestly, government funding may be your best option just because you're too low TRL. Like there's too much uncertainty in that kind of future. Now, there are exceptions, you know, Boom Aerospace most famously, like I think they are a very, 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 very long way if ever um, out from getting a product to market, but you know, they managed to get fundings. I would argue they kind of shot the moon. They, they didn't get as much traditional venture as much as like crazy billionaires who wanted a supersonic jet themselves. And so, you know, certainly if you have something that's super whiz bangy like that, um, there's interesting things, but, um, or it's like maybe trying to find a corporate partnership. The other thing we've seen a lot of in the last three years is an extreme growth of, um, uh, corporate venture capital arms. Awesome. Thanks. Well, I think that is all the questions that we got. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over to Gwen to uh, close us out. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy, for your, your comments and your advice. We, we truly appreciate it. Um, and for all of our innovators, uh, we will continue to bring you not only our technical master lectures, but also our business and our fundraising master lectures. So there was more coming for all of you in terms of pitch decks and introductions. Uh, to VCs and other potential fundraising. Uh, and uh, we wish you all um, the best with all of your endeavors. And Jeremy, we thank you very, very much for your time. And you. uh, we look forward to our uh, next master lecture. Thanks, Jeremy. Great. Have a good day.